and we are live today at the table. My name is Barbie Winterbottom, and I welcome each and every one of you, and I'm so excited for our conversation today. Before I introduce our very special guest, I would like to thank our sponsor, Daily Pay. Uh, if you are not familiar with Daily Pay, I encourage you to either reach out to me directly um, or go to their website or send me a carrier pigeon or a smoke signal. I would love to chat with you about what Daily Pay has to offer. In a quick nutshell, Daily Pay allows all of your employees to access any earned but unpaid wages at any time through an amazing app on their phone. They can do an instant transfer of funds or an overnight transfer of funds. It is not a predatory payday loan. There is no interest repayment. It is simply transferring money that the person has already earned into their account immediately. And the transfer could be free or there could be a nominal fee, which is less than an ATM fee if they want that money instantly. I've implemented daily pay at my organization when I was the CHRO. I have helped many organizations around the US implement this product and it is by far far the very best benefit I ever implemented within my organization. Employees understand that you are investing in them and that you're caring about them and helping to level the financial playing field for folks who need that little bit of support. So again, check out our friends at Daily Pay. I can't say enough good things about them and their partnership for helping me produce this program for you guys week over week. With that, we're gonna shift gears and we are going to talk about my amazing guest. So we were scheduled to talk a few weeks ago and I had to reschedule. So first I have to thank our guest for his patience and understanding. So we are welcoming to the stage today, Mr. Simon T. Bailey. Simon is an author and his latest book right here in Igniting the Power of Women Simon is also one of the top 20 keynote speakers in the US. Simon is also an executive coach and has programs out there on LinkedIn Learning that I encourage you to check out. He is just, he is the total package, guys. When we look at someone who can help ignite and open up power and leadership skills and conversations. And he's here today and we're gonna get into some pretty interesting conversations, especially because I love what he wrote. I love everything he does. So Simon, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you, Barbie. So good to be with you. Yes, we have so much to talk about. And as, as my audience knows, we absolutely love as much interaction as possible. So if you're watching us live today and you have comments or questions for myself or for Simon, please put them in the chat. We will see them as they come through and I will do my best to put them across the screen. I can't respond to the chat directly because LinkedIn doesn't allow that connectivity, but I can see your comments and we can bring them through to the conversation that way. So please uh, shout out, let us know where you're from and what questions you might have. So we are gonna deep dive right into this conversation because I feel like we're gonna have some pretty interesting dialogue and it will probably go for the full hour, I'm just guessing. <laughs> so, all right, so Simon, first I wanna talk about your most recent book, Igniting the Power of Women and what inspired you to write this book. And um, I, I'm also curious how long it took you to write the book because I'm in the process of trying to do the same. So I want to learn. So it took me three years to write the book, 10 rewrites, three title changes. And what really sparked the book is after being married for 25 years, I went through a divorce and my divorce attorney suggested that I go see a therapist. And Barbie, if the truth be told, no guy wants to go and see a therapist named Anita, who's been practicing for 40 years and has more degrees than a thermostat. And... <laughs> That's the best I've ever heard. I love that so much. And the first thing Anita said to me in one of our first sessions, she said, whatever you don't deal with will eventually deal with you. And what I recognize is I had totally shut down uh, personally, and it was impacting me professionally. And so I started writing just from a therapeutic place to really 
to begin to understand when I listen, when I really tap in to what's really going on, oh my goodness. And really uh, my daughter, my daughter was the one who came into my home office. She wanted to talk. I was emotionally unavailable. And then it hit me that I missed the moment. So that's, uh, that's what ignited the book. Man, we've all been there. I can think about moments with, with my own children and, you know, mama, can I show you this? They call me mama B because they have two moms, right? Well, they have more than two moms, but so I'm mama B mama B. Can I show you this? Or can I ask you this? And, and I'm busy in the moment of what I'm doing. And I'm like half listening, right? Half paying attention. Sure. You can show me that. And it's a drawing they're super proud of, or it's something that to me doesn't mean much. But to them, they spent all day on it, right? And through the lens of a 10-year-old, all day is a big deal. And so I completely relate with that. And I um, often beat myself up because I need to pay more attention. So I'm glad to know I'm not alone in that moment, <laughs> in those moments, right? I will, I will channel you from now on. <laughs> so that's great. What a great inspiration. And I'm sure your daughter and and all future women in your family are going to appreciate you taking the time to put those thoughts out there and to share that with the world. So I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you right now, because sure. the, the feminist in me has to ask a couple of questions, right? So this book, Ignite the Power of Women in Your Life, which I love, um, I want to take it down a little bit of a different path because I, I have... Um, I guess some questions about the why we know your personal why, but if I take this into a different context, um, it'll help illustrate my other question. So I am, as I, I, as everyone watching, I think can tell I am a white woman and Simon is a black man and there is a train of thought and there's a lot of folks out there who work in the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging space who are adamant about white people not working in the DNI space. And they're, they're really, they're, they're passionate about this belief system because they feel as though when you are born with white or light skin, you inherently have a privilege that those with dark skin don't have. And I am absolutely aligned with that. However, it's the, the belief is I, I don't know your lived experience. Therefore, who am I to speak about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging when so much of it is about race and inequalities and inequities with the, that impact those folks with black and brown skin? And I, if I take that kind of concept of unless you have the lived experience, who are you to speak on it or write about it? I then ask you as a man, how are you writing about igniting the power of women without it being condescending and, and coming across as mansplaining? Like, oh, honey, let me help you be empowered because you can't do it on your own. Right. And that's that's the way that people will interpret this. Not everyone, but there are people who are going to say, who does he think he is? writing a book about empowering women as a man, right? And so I have to ask the question, why, how, how do you do it without that whole element, you know, taking over? Yeah. So great question. Well, the first thing is if you notice the subtitle of the book, it says a guide for men. And part of the reason why I wrote the book is if the truth be told women don't need their power ignited. Men need to do their work. And if they do their work by honoring and respecting the brilliance of a woman, men will become ignited and women benefit. So let me, let me unpack this just for a moment. Right now, all the research says that the suicide rate amongst males is 3.5 times more than women. Men right now are dropping out of college and the labor market. At the same time, in the 1970s, 60% of the women uh, or men were enrolled in college. Now it's totally flip where you have more women enrolled in college than men. Okay. So let's understand this. 
And let me anchor it with just a little bit more research. Uh, according to Harvard Business Review, when women are at the helm in an organization, they're more profitable. When organizations really honor the brilliance of a woman, not only are they more profitable, but they are seen through a different lens. So when I say Ignite the Power of Women, a guide for men, it's really for guys to understand what can we do to support and be uh, a true ally for the women that we work with and the women in our lives. So I just come alongside as a guide to share where I failed, where I missed it, where I totally was clueless to what was happening around me to start a conversation. Uh, that's why I wrote it. I love that. I love that it, it the title draws you in, right? It certainly grabs your attention. But then when you explain that you're not here to preach to women about igniting their own empowerment, because I think we get that, right? You're here to say, hey guys, you're the ones who aren't getting it. And I didn't get it either, but now I'm starting to. And here's some things that we can do so that collectively we rise together, because I think that's really the point, right? And and yes. I love that the way you explained it. And in the DNI space, if we go back to that part of the conversation, I completely understand where you're coming from. A lot of folks don't know that I had a foster son for a couple of years, and I absolutely love and adore him. He's now 26 years old, and he's a very dark-skinned uh, black man. And I did have a glimpse into what it was like for him while he was living with me. Um, he was pulled over for walking to school in a quote unquote white neighborhood. Wow. I had to walk to school with him and let the police officers know that one, I didn't appreciate them pulling my son over because in his backpack were books and homework, mm -hmm. which they searched frequently. Um, you know, and I was taking time out of my day to make sure he was safe from them. And I would do it all over again for his sake, but I shouldn't have to. And so I, I experienced the looks when we would go to a restaurant and, and I, I get it from, from my lens, but again, I'm not him and I'll never know what it's like to feel what he felt. Um, but I can help educate others on what I did experience alongside him. Mm -hmm. and the lessons that I learned living alongside him and my other friends and, and what I experience in the world. So I think that that's a great way to help illuminate some of the challenges that some people simply don't have exposure to. Mm -hmm. Not everyone has the privilege of having a young black man live in their home for a couple of years and to understand what that dynamic is like for mm -hmm. them. Um, and so you've taken your lived experience and you're now helping so many others who may not have that opportunity to, to help explain it. So what if we get to some of the lessons you learned and, and how you've done it, what would you say if you if you could boil it down to? And I know the book does a great job of this, but what what were your top three lessons that you learned in how to listen better and tune in and amplify voices other than? men in the workplace yeah i think the first lesson is women don't want to be changed they want to be understood and really when you really understand how a woman is wired you shift from selective hearing to authentic listening i think the second big idea is women have a bigger brain than men and this is not to make men you know, feel marginalized or lose their masculinity. But if anything, when you engage a woman intellectually, it opens her up to share how she sees the future. And if any organization or business is going to realize its potential, it must leverage women's intelligence. I think the third uh, interesting thing is that women have intuition women have a sixth sense about something, whereas men, it takes us a minute to get there because we're very linear in our approach and how we see things. And so a woman will, will be there in a nanosecond and guys sometimes will be there a year later or will never get it. So what I'm really saying is when we come alongside and really respect and honor and stop marginalize, uh, marginalizing women, 
all of a sudden we begin to realize who we can become because of that emotionally honest conversation. Yeah. I love that. You know, I wrote a framework for HR professionals called the five imperatives. And the third um, is to use data, experience, and intuition, right? Mm -hmm. To influence and inform decisions by using data, experience, and intuition. So, and it taps into exactly what you're saying. Data alone doesn't tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. Experience alone doesn't tell the whole story because things change and evolve and your experience might be very singular. Right. And intuition doesn't tell the whole story either. It can, it, we have to make sure we're in touch with our intuition, but that we check it for our own bias and prejudice, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where the balance comes into play. But if you can combine data and analytics, and lived experience with your intuition, to me, that is the trifecta of being able to influence and inform decisions for strategy, for leadership, for problem solving, for all of the things that we do each and every day. Because any one of those things as a standalone can get a little gray because it's not a complete picture. So to your point, when we can partner together and say, well, how do you see this? What are the things that are jumping out at you? Here's instantly what jumped out at me. Both can be valid, right? I think that's part of what we have to understand that it doesn't have to be a competition of, oh, well, he's right because he sees it this way or she's right because she sees it this way. We can both be right and see it from our own lived experiences and come up with a solution that's even better than we would come up with on our own. And I know that seems super basic, but it's one of the hardest things to do in, in a work environment, right? We talk about being collaborative, but I think what ends up happening is we get so convinced that we have to dig in because we want to be heard. We want to be seen and valued for who we are. And so to your point, if you can hold space to allow someone to express what they have to say from their point of view, we stop jockeying for position and we then allow the organic conversations and collaboration to happen. Is that is that kind of how you're seeing it unfold as well? Totally. I, you just articulated exactly how I would tee that up. See, when men release the need to be right and become open to the intelligence that's emerging what you are doing is honoring the brilliance of another colleague and together everyone wins. So it's not, you know, I win, you lose. It's we win and ultimately the customer and the organization benefits because of the collective intelligence and genius that's been shared. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think too, one of the things we're learning and, and you've, you've illustrated this beautifully is that those soft skills mm -hmm. are the hardest to learn and the hardest to execute. Yes. And, and they've been diminished for a really long time. And for decades, right, we focused on the hard skills. What is your degree? Did you work at one of the big five? Did you do this? Did you do that? All of those things. But data shows us that with the rapid pace, the VUCA landscape, right, the change that we are in, excuse me, okay, I think I was, and that that is not going to go away. Those hard skills become obsolete very fast. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm coaching folks, we talk about that. I do a lot of training these days around how to properly interview, mm -hmm. right? Because no one is, or, you know, we're not born knowing how to properly elicit information or solicit information from people in an interview setting. And there's an assumption made often that when you're promoted to being a people leader, you know how to interview. And that is not the case. And so to help people understand, we talk about this a lot, is that it's a, it's not an interrogation. It's a conversation. Right. And we're there to learn about how these people apply their knowledge yes. because the, the quote knowledge is power i don't believe is is the fullest version of that quote that we could be look we could be leaning into 
to me, it's the application of knowledge is where the power is. So how do we do that? And you know something I don't know, and I know something you don't know. So how do we then bring that together and apply it collectively so that we all get better? And hard skills don't always matter in those conversations because what we went to school for 20 years ago is likely not even relevant today, right? Like we had typewriters, we had word processors, we had all those things that nobody even uses anymore. So do we really need to understand someone's words per minute on a typing test? Mm -hmm. Do we really need all of those things that we held so valuable in the past, right? That now we wouldn't even think twice about it. So how do we shift that understanding that the behaviors, habits, and the how is just, if not more important than the what? And I think yeah. that's what you're doing here right, is helping us open our eyes to how we make that shift and how we have that robust dialogue. Sure, absolutely, totally agree. And I think what you've just articulated is that everyone listening needs to have a consistent learning system where they unlearn and relearn and mm -hmm. totally be open to, to go with the new learning that's emerging. Yes, yes, and we have to open our minds up to that to say, what I knew then was true. Yes. So we're not making you wrong, right? Yes. Learning something new doesn't make you wrong for what you already know. Mm -hmm. It's expansive, right? It's that growth mindset. It's that ability to lean into, I don't know everything. Yes. And you can get stuck in that space, especially when you're a leader, because you take the burden on that you're there to help your team and give them the answers and do all of this. But really, I find, and I'm, I would I would love your thoughts on this, the best leaders are the ones who are the most curious about learning, and yes. they don't think they know it all, because yes. I know I sure don't. <laughs> so we do have a question for you, Stephanie Adolph. Thank you for um, sharing your question. We would love to hear Simon comment on the major influential women in his life. Wow. Hi, Stephanie, and thank you so much for this question. Well, I have to start with Miss Rita Lankis, who was my English teacher in school. My freshman year in high school was a total disaster, but when I transferred to schools, Miss Rita Lankis said to me, young man, I want you to write a speech and give it before the entire school. And that at 15 years of age changed the trajectory of my life. I would say the next person is Dr. John Yetta Cole, who's the former president of Spelman College. Uh, years ago, she said to me, young man, dream big and go for it, never stop. I then would have to say Pat Ingfer, who was my first general manager, who gave me a hand up, not just a hand out. And she taught me the power of paying attention to detail, never settling for the status quo. Valerie Ferguson, who today is an executive at Disney, uh, years ago, she would challenge me and say, never allow the pigmentation of your skin to hold you back from being the very best that you can be. Uh, these women left an imprint on my head, my heart, and my hands, and it's really shaped who I have become today. That's amazing. And that you, you remember your teacher from that long ago and that moment. Now, did you deliver a speech to the entire school? I did because the year before I had failed basically almost out of high school. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you now. I went out for football and I got cut. I went out for basketball. And they said, you are not the next Magic Johnson. And I got cut. I went out for cross country. And they said, my brother, you are a little slow. You might you might track and field. They said, you should do cross country. And it was Ms. Rita Lankas who helped me find my confidence and uh, really helped me believe in who I could become. So I'm forever grateful uh, to uh -oh. her. We had a chance to thank her. I love that. You know, I have a similar experience. So in, in junior high and grade school and high school, I was in music school, music camp, theater camp. I took voice lessons. I, I was everything music, piano lessons. It, I was never involved in sports. And so when I got to high school, I thought, OK, I'm supposed to be involved in sports. Every one of my friends is involved in sports. So I'm going to go and you know, softball looks relatively manageable and they can just put me in the outfield and let me, you know, go to pasture and I don't have to really be super talented to do this. So I, 
I'll never forget this moment. I go to the softball tryouts and I'm in the outfield and I came back in and, and the coach was very, very kind. And, and mm. she came up to me afterwards and she said, I love that you tried this, mm. but would you consider just singing our national anthem for us? <laughs> So she's basically telling me to stay in my lane of music. <laughs> That's how the sports world would benefit from my contributions. And I, um, I love that she told me that and I will never forget that lesson. Um, but same, same with you, right? Somebody, somebody says, Hey, here's, here's what you're really good at doing. And let's redirect some of your efforts into something that will help you shine. And sure. now look at you now, now you're one of the top 20 speakers in the U S so I think she did you a great service there for sure. That's amazing. I'm forever grateful, forever grateful. I would be as well. So when we look at your book, I love the way you put this together. Um, it's very, um, you know, it's got a lot of bold, illustrative points. So you know exactly where to focus and how to focus. So if you're like me, I don't always read books from beginning to end. I kind of open them and get into a moment and then I'll go back and reference it or I'll leave, uh, I'll listen to the book and then go back and take notes. Was there a thought process you had about putting your book together in this manner so that it becomes a reference tool as well as a read, perhaps? So our brilliant team came together and I cannot take credit at all. Stevie Johns, who's a director of business development and Kendra, who is our brilliant designer, they came together and Kendra had a vision and she said, here's what I think we should do. And because I, I have evolved in my thinking and my development, I said, yes, if that's what you think we should do, we should do it. And the first draft of her design like literally knock the cover off the ball. So what you're holding in your hands is uh, Kendra Cagle's brilliant insight into designing this. So thank you, Kendra. Yes, I love it. I love it because it really does draw you in. Look, online dating. So, I mean, <laughs> this book has a whole lot more than just work stuff in it, guys, just so you know. Just so you know, there's a lot in here. One of the questions I have for you is how do you, in the workplace, and, and I'll give you a scenario this is a story that happened to me and I've shared this story before, but I'd love to know as a man who's advocating for women in the workforce, if you could, if you experience this scenario, I'd love for you to coach the men listening and watching and the folks who will watch this in the future of how this could have been handled differently. So I had an idea based on some things I had done in my past in, in, in implementing a new, um, a new system at work. I'll leave it at that. And I kept bringing it up and I kept bringing it up. And the CEO, white male, kept pushing me down. He didn't understand it and he couldn't wrap his head around it. And so instead of him acknowledging that he didn't understand it and saying, hey, can we talk offline so I get it? He would make fun of me for it. And he would call, you know, come up with nicknames and just crazy things. Fast forward six months later, we hire a new COO who I absolutely loved. Um, an older, probably early 60s white man who said exactly, exactly the same things that I had been saying. And all of a sudden, it was the greatest idea that had ever happened. And I'm, I'm literally in the room, like looking around for candid camera, like this can't be happening. And I approached the CEO about it privately. And I was like, Help me understand how I could have said this differently, because when I brought this up for the past six months, you wanted no part of it. He mentions it. And within a week, it's implemented. What could I have done differently? And of course, he was like, oh, no, I didn't make fun of you. I would never do that. You've got great ideas. And I'm like, dude, you did. Here, let me quote you. Right. So in a circumstance like that, when you see a woman in the workplace bringing forward ideas, and being shot down, how as a man in the same room, can you be that advocate? How do you handle those situations so that the women in the room actually feel and experience your advocacy? I love this question. And I have heard this scenario more times than I can count on both hands. First of all, let me just make a comment and then I'll step into this coaching opportunity. Men that have a need to poach, steal, and marginalize women, it's because of their ego 
instead of uh, having eco, ego, edging greatness out, e eco, engaging, caring often. So here's how I would coach that. I would say to the CEO, Barbie bought up a great idea. I think we should run with her idea that she has teed up because it will benefit us in the long run. Now, why? All of a sudden, I become a champion for you and I have no need to take credit, but I am ensuring that your name is heard early and often and celebrating your idea while you are right there in the room because visibility gives credibility. I want to make sure that you get the credit and I'm willing to put my brand name uh, on the table to say, this is a great idea and how do we make it happen and ensure that you get the credit because when we celebrate your idea, it activates you to bring more ideas to the organization. What happens when a man steals a woman's idea, it shuts her down and she suppresses her innovative insights because if it happened once, it can happen again. So if you really want to be an ally, speak up early and often, have the emotional intellect to recognize what's happening and go against the CEO and say, you know what? I want to make sure that this idea is not stolen by anyone else. Barbie is a leader in this room. We need to run with her idea. I love that. And we can do that for others. It's not just men supporting women. It's white people supporting yes. black and brown people, especially black women. We know that one of the most marginalized and difficult roles in this world is a black woman in the workplace. Mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and that woman needs our support and deserves our support. Some of the most brilliant people on this planet are black women and history show, shows us this over and over and over again. So taking that same concept and all the women who are listening, all the white women who are listening, we need to do the same thing, right? So if we expect men of all races, colors, ethnicities, all of that to support us as women, we need to take a dose of that medicine and support other women and people who don't look like us. So I love, I love how you presented that. And I think it's just, it's, it's not that hard to do. It's, it's not really coming. not that hard to do. It's Can I share a story? Yes, please. Yes, absolutely. So back in the 1950s, one of Marilyn Monroe's best friends was Ella Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. And Ella Fitzgerald wanted to perform at the McCumber Club in Los Angeles. And for whatever reason, the manager said, you're an overweight black woman. You're not going to perform here. And Marilyn Monroe, she happened to be talking to Ella and she said, hey, I want to perform there. And Marilyn called the manager and said, if you will give her a contract to perform, I will show up opening night and bring my good friends with me, Frank Sinatra and Judy Garland, and we will sit in the front of your club. Well, sure enough, opening night, Ella got the contract and there was Marilyn Monroe because Marilyn used her influence and who she was, her brand, to say, this is my friend, give her a hand up, not just a handout. Yes, I love that. And you know, there's a lot of folks, I think, in history who have done similar things, and some have been successful, and some haven't. Betty White also um, did something very similar for a Black dancer, I believe, um, a black performer on her mm -hmm. show mm -hmm. and they wouldn't allow him. And she's, she said, well, then I'm not doing the show. And so he became a regular on her show and he was amazingly talented. I don't believe he's living anymore. And I sadly, I don't remember his name, but mm -hmm. I do remember that story. Um, so we, we all have to do that. We all have to be advocates for one another in ways that are meaningful to that person. Right. I think the key is that we're not self-serving saying, look at me, I'm an advocate for, for black and brown people, or look at me, because then you're centering yourself. The way you shared the example is you, you centered the other person, right? You said my name, you said Barbie's idea was great. 
I support doing what she recommends and let's talk about that. So I think that's that's such a big part of being an advocate is that we have to remove ourselves from the center of the conversation, which can be hard for some people. So you said something in the very beginning and it was the difference between ego and eco. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to um, state that and, and type it across so people could see that. So can you say that again for me so that people can get that concept? Yes. Yeah, so ego is edging greatness out. And so many times I've allowed my ego to really get out in front of me. I'm, I'm over my skis, right? But eco is engaging, caring often. I just recently completed a certification in caring science. And one of the things they talk about in caring science is this ability to honor humanity. And when I honor humanity, I'm really coming, Barbie, from a place of being human-centered and when I'm human-centered, I'm engaging caring often by listening more and talking less. Mm. When I listen more, I understand the same letters that spell the word listen, spell the word silent. So when I honor you in the moment through an eco lens, engaging caring often, I'm caring about you as a whole human being. Yes. That's great. I'm going to use that. I'll have to put a little TM Simon Bailey next to it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. But it's little things like that, right, that, that stick in our brains and we can remember. So creating that, um, that, that acronym is really helpful because otherwise nobody's going to remember three paragraphs, but they can remember that. And that's really impactful. Those are little things that can help us in our day to day. Um, Simon, we have another question for you. Um, may we allow Simon to share things he feels are important to tell us before we close? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Stephanie. We will make sure that Simon has an opportunity to give us some parting thoughts because we know they're going to be good. So thank you. Thank you for the suggestion for sure. Um, so in your day to day, hmm. you are speaking around the world, which is amazing. So um, I would love to know, like when you're engaged to do keynote addresses, what are folks bringing you in to talk about? Yeah. So right now, obviously, with the great resignation happening, how do we look at talent with a fresh perspective? And as you you know this better than, than I do, is that people don't leave organizations. They leave emotionally clueless managers who don't give a rip about them. That's why people leave. So how do we really begin to hold on to talent? Uh, the other thing is that they want me to talk about is leadership. And what I recognized when I first got promoted to a leadership role at Disney years ago, I was a boss with an agenda instead of a leader with a vision. So how do leaders begin to really think differently? The job of a leader is not just to motivate people to work harder. The job of a leader is to invite individuals on a journey to discover the leader within themselves while they're following you. So you can never take a person to a place that you've not been yourself. And then the third thing that organizations bring me in to talk about is customer service is a department, but customer love is a mindset. And, and how do we move to an ethos of customer love? I love that. You know, there's so well, there's so much to unpack with all of that. Um, we, we should have additional sessions where we talk about those. <laughs> uh, I, I could not agree with you more. And, and, when, I, and when I'm doing speaking or coaching or what have you, I often talk about the difference between customer service and customer centricity. Mm -hmm. And it's simple reframing. So one of the one of the examples I share is if you're if you work in a call center and somebody says, what do you do for a living? And you say, well, I take incoming calls from customers. Simply reframing that mm -hmm. to say, I help customers solve problems and provide opportunities to enhance their experience. Yes. Yes. Right. It's just yeah. helping our people reframe and understand the value in the work they're doing and, and moving from transactions to points of meaningful connection mm -hmm. is huge. And it, and it can be as simple as just changing your mindset. But we have to help people through that because it's not always intuitive. It's not always what we think about. And you have such a dynamic way of, of doing that with with when you talk to folks, when you present, when you're doing this, 
Um, so I, I can't wait to, to see more of what you have to offer from that perspective. Now with your LinkedIn learning programs, let's talk about those programs and what you're leaning into there. And so for anybody watching, um, how do they find them and what would they, you know, what would they learn from those programs? Sure. So they just go to LinkedIn learning. And uh, one of my courses is called building business relationships. Everything that I've learned in business uh, after working six different companies, 10 different jobs, 2000 organizations in 50 countries is it doesn't matter what your pedigree or your academic degrees might be. Do you understand how to build a relationship? Because relationships are really the currency of the future. And so in that course, I begin to unpack, how do you, how do you understand the system? How do you work the system? How do you leverage relationships to advance your career? So many people wonder, how do people get ahead in a business? And they're like, wait a minute, I have more degrees, more contacts. How did that person get the job? Don't hate, they had a relationship that you didn't have. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And they learned how to apply the knowledge in a way that makes sense. Right. And I ask this all the time. The smartest person on the planet is likely not the most successful. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And and we think about some of the most successful people out there. Some of them are educated. Some of them didn't even finish high school. I think about Richard Branson, yes. right, the CEO and founder of, of Virgin. And I know a lot of folks use him as an example, but he doesn't have formal education. And do we think he's not smart? I think he's brilliant. Yes. So education is great. And I'm not diminishing the value of higher education. So don't come at me, people. But it's what you do with that education that matters. And to your point, how do you connect with others and build relationships so that you can show what you've learned and how to apply it? We all need those connections. Without them, we wouldn't be where we are. And it doesn't matter if, if it's teaching if it's being a public speaker, if it's whatever your career trajectory is, we all need those advocates and those people to one, call us out when we're outside of our integrity and when we're not performing at our best. I think those are our best allies and advocates, people who are willing to have those tough conversations with us. But we also need those people who say our names when we're not in the room and amplify them when we are. And you've really illustrated that in so many different ways, not only in the book, but in this conversation, I think that's huge. And I've seen you do that, by the way. Um, Simon and I have a mutual, very dear friend. Her name is Carla. Hopefully Carla's watching. I know she might be in a meeting. I don't know if she is or not, but Thanks, Carla is one of the dearest, most sincere, authentic people you'll ever meet. And I have seen the influence you have had on her and it's because you have shown her her own greatness where she doubted herself where she doubted her worth and her value you have been a consistent voice in her life to say girl you've got this you can write a book just like i can how many pages did you write today right i know that you're helping drive her and advocating for her greatness and we all need those people yes. and, and and i know you do it for more than just miss carla so I, I thank you for that because we all need those people in our lives. So we are, we are, I knew we would be at an hour. So I do want to open it up for you, um, Simon, so that our audience hears anything else that you want to share um, with us before we, we close it out. And then I'll ask you some rapid fire, just fun questions. I would just simply say, first of all, thank you for this opportunity and everyone listening to me, Who's one person that you can reach out today and encourage them? Encouragement is oxygen for the soul. Uh, so send them a text, uh, call them, write them a handwritten note. I think the second thing to consider is within your organization and within your culture, who can you sponsor? Who can you help uh, advance in their career? And then finally, the third thing is make sure you take care of yourself by taking your meds. MEDS is an acronym that stands for meditate, exercise, diet, and sleep. And in the spirit of mental health month, how do we really begin to think about uh, mentally showing up, taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of others? Yes, that's so powerful. Man, you are on it with the acronyms. I love it. I love it. I'm going to steal that one too. <laughs> I'll give you credit. I promise. I will give you credit. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so we're just going to have a couple of fun questions here. 
if you had to choose when eating ice cream, I don't know if you eat ice cream or not, but chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. No, me too. I'm always vanilla. Um, beach or mountains? Beach. Me too. And what book or books have you given away the most other than your own? Wow. So the book that I'm telling everyone to get a hold of is Influence is Your Superpower, written by Zoe Chance. Uh, she's a phenomenal professor at the Yale School of Management, and she really walks you through the science of how do you really begin to influence others. So I've told a ton of people about the book, Influence is Your Superpower. I'm going to order it today. I end up ordering books every week because I ask people this and then I'm like, oh, I need that one. So I, I always end up ordering books. I love that. Well, Simon, it has been such a pleasure to chat with you today. Wow. Um, you. I just, I, I love learning from my guests and you have so much to share with our audience and, and everyone. If you are looking for a keynote speaker, if you are looking for learning programs or an executive coach, I encourage you guys reach out to Simon. His website's showing on the screen right now. You can also connect with him on LinkedIn or follow him on LinkedIn. He may not have any connections left, but you know he's pretty active out there on LinkedIn, so you can find him there and other socials wherever wherever he is. But definitely check out his website. Check out what he has to offer. Um, I hope you'll come back, friend. Um, mm -hmm. We have so many things we could deep dive into. Um, so you've given me tons of ideas for wow. future Thank programs. You. Um, and so I want to thank all of you in our audience for being here. As always, we will upload this video to the Business of HR YouTube channel so you can watch it and share it with others. Um, and thank you all for being here. And I wish you a wonderful rest of your Tuesday. And we will see you next week. And Simon, once again, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Wonderful to chat with you today. Thank you. All right, everybody. See you next time.